Okay, there we are, back in business. Okay. So, uh, okay, so let's carry on. Uh, and uh, the, we have been looking at uh, yesterday the Upakalesa Sutta, which shows how to overcome all of the defilements of the mind and then entering samadhi. But uh, one of the things we have not really looked at yet is how that actually works. Uh, yeah, well, how to do the meditation practice, uh, what sort of meditation you should be doing. And uh, so next I want to look at more the actual process of meditation itself. Uh, and of course one of the main methods of meditation found in the suttas is anapanasati, which is the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And what is interesting is that the Buddha himself used the mindfulness of breathing before his awakening as part of his practice. Uh, and this is what this sutta is about. Uh, and this is quite a profound sutta. It starts off with mindfulness of breathing and then it goes on to all the results that arise from mindfulness of breathing all the way to the ve very end of the path. Uh, and some of the things at the very end are very deep and profound and, and uh, I suppose for that reason also interesting. So we will certainly look at it. Uh, not sure exactly how much detail, but we will uh, check it out and see if we can gain something from that. Uh, so this sutta is called the simile of the lamp, uh, Padip Opama Sutta, and uh, it uh, goes as follows. This is found in the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, the 54th chapter, which is all on mindfulness of breathing, uh, sutta number 8. Mendicants, when immersion, which is samadhi, due to mindfulness of breathing, uh, is developed and cultivated, uh, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Uh, how so? Uh, yeah, so here we have the expression samadhi due to mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and what that shows us is that the main purpose of mindfulness of breathing is actually to bring us to samadhi, uh, this one-pointedness of mind, uh, bringing the mind together. Uh, and when the Buddha says something is very fruitful and beneficial, the Buddha doesn't mince his words. Uh, he, Buddha tends to be understated. Uh, so when he says that, you can take it means how to get to the very end of the Buddhist path. So now then we come to the standard exposition of mindfulness of breathing, which is a very beautiful exposition and very useful to have some insight into. So let's have a, uh, have a look at this. Uh, it's when a mendicant gone to the wilderness uh, or to the foot of a tree, uh, or to an empty hut, sits down cross-legged, uh, sets their body straight, uh, and establishes mindfulness in front of them. Uh. Just mindful they breathe in, uh, mindful they breathe out. So this is the uh, standard beginning of mindfulness of breathing, how it is explained every time you come across it in the suttas. Uh, including in the Anapanasati Sutta itself, which is the main exposition of mindfulness of breathing. Uh, it always starts like this. Uh, and in many ways, this in, is perhaps some of the most important instructions uh, in this Sutta is found right here at the very beginning. Uh, because remember, the idea of uh, meditation is that it is largely an automatic process. And if it is an automatic process, then how we get started is very, very important. Uh, once you get the starting point right, uh, then the rest is automatic. Uh, get the starting point wrong, uh, and the automatic process doesn't actually work. Uh. So this is really, this matters enormously. Uh. And as you will see here, it starts off by saying, gone to the wilderness, uh, Aranyagato, to the foot of a tree, uh, or an empty hut, Sunyagaragato. Uh. Yeah, so the idea here is that if you're going to do meditation in a deep way, uh, and it's going to give the full results of the path of meditation, usually it happens in seclusion. All of these uh, phrases here have to do with the idea of seclusion. Uh, withdrawing from society. First of all, um, uh, kaya viveka, the seclusion of the body, and then the chitta viveka, which comes from that, the seclusion of the mind, yeah? one after the other. Uh, and so this does not mean that you cannot do any meditation in daily life. You can, uh, but you cannot expect uh, very profound results from the kind of ordinary meditation. Ordinary meditation in daily life can be very useful. 
it helps to stabilize the mind. Uh, it helps you to live well during the, your, your days because your mind is kind of, you have a more positive outlook and this kind of thing. So it can be very useful in daily life, but you cannot expect the results of the Anapanasati Sutta to really happen. This happens in seclusion. Huh? So occasionally, this is why I would recommend people sometimes uh, to take some time out, uh, take a retreat somewhere, uh, especially for those of you who are meditators, of course. Uh, take a retreat somewhere, see what happens when you do that, uh, and see if you are actually making progress uh, on the path. One of the ways to decide whether you're making progress or not is to do a retreat you know, once a year, once every six months or whatever, and then see if it deepens your meditation practice. Uh, you know progress is happening if your meditation is becoming more profound. Uh, and it is actually important on the path that we do measure our progress. Is it working or not what we're doing? Uh, yeah, it matters. Uh, because if it isn't working, if you're not getting any results, uh, then we need to take some kind of uh, remedial measures. Uh, to ask ourselves, what is the problem? Can I, is there something I'm not doing right? Uh, can I improve something in my conduct, my practice? Yeah? All of these things. Uh, and you really only get to that if you know whether the, uh, you're getting the results from the path or not. So sometimes going on a retreat can be helpful uh, because that gives you more clarity about what is happening. So uh, you go to a place of seclusion and then you sit down. Yeah, you says here nisidati, which means you sit down. Uh, and so real meditation practice happens in the sitting posture. Uh, especially things like mindfulness or breathing. Uh, it is too subtle to do while walking or uh, uh, usually can perhaps be done lying down, but lying down is not uh, uh, is, is more kind of dangerous uh, <laughs> than sitting, yeah. <laughs> the snoring problem. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so sitting is really the ideal posture for mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. So you sit down, that's where it happens. Uh, how do we sit? Uh, doesn't matter so much. Uh, sit in a way that is comfortable. Remember the idea here is to get the body, put the body to one side, get the body out of the way, that's kind of the idea. So being comfortable is what is most important. Not indulgent, uh, but comfortable. There's a big difference between indulgence and comfort. Uh, indulgence means you are enjoying the, uh, the, the what is happening. Yeah, wow, this is so nice. Yeah. Ooh, and then before you, of course, that's not how meditation works, uh, but comfortable so that the body is not a problem. That's the idea. So whether you sit cross-legged or you sit uh, uh, on a chair or you sit leaning against the wall or whatever you do, all of that is quite irrelevant as long as you are at ease. Uh, it says, Nisi, that it says, Palangang uh, Abhuditva, having put the legs cross legged. So that is kind of the ideal posture, uh, but it's not a required posture. I know lots of people who get good meditation in all kinds of posture. Uh. The only posture I do not recommend, as I said the other day, is standing upside down on your head. Uh, because I, I heard of a monk who did that, uh, and he actually got some kind of nimitta, some bright light, while he was standing on his head, uh, and it was a bad result. <laughs> He kind of fell down and, and kind of found himself in a big kind of jumble on the floor, legs and arms kind of all over the place. So. Um, and then we have Ujjung, Ujjung Kayang Panidaya. So this is um, setting the body straight. And the idea, of course, is that when your body is straight, you have more clarity usually. But that too is about time and place. So start off by relaxing, and then as your mind becomes clear, then you set your body straight. Yeah, there's these words over here, body straight. Ujju is a straight. Kaya is your body. Panidaya is like placing or you know putting the body straight. And then the last one, which is the most important one here, is parimukkang, parimukkang satting upatapetma. Satting, of course, is mindfulness. And parimukkang is this, one of these words that is uh, much uh, debated what exactly it means. But I think the idea of in front here is pretty much right. In other words, in this time and space, here and now, is kind of sort of what it means. Yeah, in uh, in your immediate presence, uh, both in time and space. Uh. And so this is kind of the critical one. Uh. You cannot really do mindfulness of breathing. Uh. You cannot really do any kind of meditation practice uh, without having mindfulness established first. Uh. And this is why 
usually I recommend that when you do your meditation, you just relax, you allow things to be, you wait for the mindfulness to arise, you nudge the mind a little bit because the mind needs a little bit of guidance, but not force, but just a bit of nudging. Yeah, yeah the idea of getting into a good mood, uh, a good state of positive state of mind, where you feel good about yourself, uh, you feel you know positive about your meditation, about yourself, about the environment, you feel at ease, you feel relaxed, uh, you're not interested in the future, you realize that most of the future we think about is completely uninteresting anyway, you let go of that future and you realize the future that is interesting is the one that I make now, simply by sitting in meditation. Huh? And once you get that, it starts to become really uninteresting to think about what you're going to do tomorrow and all these kind of things, uh, because you realize actually that is th that doesn't do anything here. Yeah. That future is never created by thinking about it. Uh. And then you let go of the past. Yeah, L letting go of the past will often mean things like uh, forgiveness uh, and uh, understanding other people in the right way, not bear having any grudges uh, and these kind of things. Uh. And in this way, you gently guide your mind, uh, yeah? you nudge the mind in the right direction. Uh, and as you do that, what you find is that as you relax, uh, mindfulness comes about. Uh, it's a little bit difficult on uh, a retreat such as this because it is not really fully intended to be a meditation retreat. This meditation is only a part of this. Uh, you can even say a minor part. Uh, uh, but you really get to test these things when you go on a proper meditation retreat, where meditation is the main emphasis of the retreat. Uh, so remember this, and also remember that uh, the idea of uh, establishing mindfulness is something that we do throughout uh, our daily existence. Yeah? Whenever we live well, uh, we do the right thing, we practice the first factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, then we are establishing mindfulness for the long run. I don't mean establishing mindfulness in the present, here and now. You need, always need a degree of mindfulness to even be able to live well. But what I mean is living well so that mindfulness becomes established in the long run. Uh, if you live your ordinary life really well, uh, with kindness, with care, overcoming ill will, overcoming defilements, uh, you will find that from one year to the next one, when you go on retreat, things will have changed. Uh, you will have more mindfulness. Uh, more ability to just stay in the present, uh, and things actually will alter in your uh, uh, in your spiritual life. Uh. So this is why it is so important to live well in daily life, yeah, because it actually affects the entire spiritual path. Uh. It affects how you feel about yourself here and now. It affects your your meditation ability. It affects your ability to develop wisdom down the track, and also, of course, it affects any rebirth that you may get down the track. So it affects everything, basically. It's extraordinarily important to live, live well. Huh? So this is how this comes about in the uh, long run. And only then, uh, when mindfulness is established, uh, when you feel at ease, uh, you feel the mind is present, uh, you feel a sense of relaxed awareness, uh, that is when mindfulness of breathing starts. And remember this idea of waiting for the breath. Don't go to the breath, don't, because the moment you think you have to go to the breath, there will be a degree of grasping that breath. That is the whole idea of going for something, is that you grasp it. The moment you grasp the breath, the moment you try to hold it and try to keep it in your awareness, at that moment it's going to be uncomfortable. Because the whole idea of grasping is tight, it is uncomfortable, you can feel the tension within her. The idea is to be relaxed with the breath. So even while you are watching the breath, you should have this idea of sitting in an armchair and just relaxing. Yeah? The breath is there, you don't hold it. And because you don't hold it, the breath suddenly disappears and is gone. And that's okay. And then you just wait for the breath to come back again. Yeah? If this is just a trick of the mind to not to go for the breath. Yeah? and then you wait, the breath comes, then you are automatically doing mindfulness of breathing. There's nothing you have to do. You're automatically doing it because the breath has come back to you by itself. You're not doing it. Do, am I making any sense? Yeah? Okay. Good. Oh, sorry, I'm glad. So, uh, that, that's, uh, so that's how it comes about. Yeah? And then we have this beautiful sentence here. Just mindful. Uh, he breathes in, just mindful, they breathe out. 
And uh, you don't notice the little word just there. Huh? Yeah, you see the pal here, satova. So this is uh, 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 two words, sati plus eva. And uh, sati is mindfulness, and eva is like a uh, little word that can mean a couple of different things, but the normal meaning of the word is just or only. Only mindful, he breathes in. Only mindful, he breathes out. Uh, and these little words are no coincidence. Uh, yeah, sometimes they are coincidence, sometimes they are like fillers. They're just used to fill in the text to make it uh, flow nicely. Uh, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, because the idea here is that all you have to do is to be mindful. Uh, there's no will required. Yeah, this is what I've been talking about before, some of these other suttas that say you don't use will in your meditation. Uh, here is the same thing, no will. All there is is mindfulness. Uh, all, all there is is sitting back and allowing the process to happen. Uh, you don't do the process. That is why it is just mindful you breathe in, just mindful you breathe out. Uh. So this is the start of uh, Anapanasati, uh, mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and now we come into the various stages of this practice. There's 16 stages to the Anapanasati Sutta. And so we're going to look at all of those uh, and see how they work and how, they, how you kind of uh, uh, go from one stage to the next one. And as we are going through this whole Anapanasati Sutta, we are essentially also doing the same work that we saw in the Upakilesa Sutta before, where you are abandoning the defilements of the mind. Here, the abandoning happens through the act of watching the breath. As you watch the breath, the defilements are abandoned automatically. Sometimes you need to contemplate a little bit to help, help but a lot of the time it is also happens by default as you do that. Why is that the case? Just to give you an idea how that works. So that most of the defilements that we have, especially defilements like desire and ill will, they need to be sustained to be able to stay in the mind. If you are desiring something, uh, whatever that desire might be, the only way that that desire remains in the mind is because you are thinking about that object as desirable. You're seeing the good aspects of that object. Uh, the moment you are watching the breath, you are no longer focusing on that object. Uh, and because you're letting go of the object, uh, desire itself dies down. Uh, you're no longer fueling the desire because you're withdrawing your attention from the object that gives rise to desire. So by the mere fact of watching the breath, uh, desires disappear. Uh, yeah? Gradually, gradually, gradually. Uh, same thing with ill will. Ill will needs to be fueled uh, to sustain itself. Uh, so if you take away the attention from the object that is the cause of the ill will, the ill will itself will gradually disappear. Uh, so by the mere fact of being aware of the breath, uh, actually the defilement starts to decline. Uh, but often it is not enough. Uh, Often there are underlying defilements that are much deeper, like attachments, for example, to the body, to the senses. Uh, but sometimes we need to do a little bit of contemplation as well. And I've talked about uh, quite extensively before the contemplations of the five senses and these kind of things. Uh, and sometimes we need to do that to help uh, this process, to give it a bit more uh, power, if you like. Uh, and then. Uh, sometimes you can overcome those problems, those blockages uh, that get in the way on the path. Uh, this is especially for those of you who are really serious about meditation practice, uh, because this is really the sort of requirements that makes this path work. Yeah. Okay, so now we come to the 16 stages of uh, Anapanasati. Ana Pana sati, ana in breathing, pana out breathing, sati mindfulness. Uh, breathing in heavily, they know uh, I'm breathing in heavily. Uh, breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily. Uh oh. Diga means long, but uh, I think diga means long, but I think his idea is that in uh, the kind of the, the English uh, idiom usually talks about heavy and light breathing. Yeah. I think that's kind of the point here. Yeah. So uh, you, can, you could say long breath or heavy breath, you know, it's uh, basically two sides of the same thing. But I realize that uh, the steps are missing here, so I'm going to have to bring up another sutta that has all the steps in it. Uh, 
because otherwise we are going to have a problem. So let's see. Uh, 118, I, because I would like to go through these steps. So here we are. This is the real sutta on mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah. Okay, so here we are. So, um, breathing in heavily, they know I'm breathing in heavily, or long if you like. Yeah. Breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily. Yeah. Breathing in lightly, or if you like short, they know I'm breathing in lightly. Breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. They practice like this. I'll breathe in experiencing the whole body. Yeah. They practice like this, I'll breathe out, experiencing the whole body. They practice like this, I'll breathe in, stilling the physical process. They practice like this, I'll breathe out, stilling the physical process. So these are the first four steps of the Anapanasati Sutta. And um, so uh, what we are seeing here, we're seeing that you are aware of the breath, yeah. First of all, whether it is long and short or heavy and light, uh, that's kind of the starting point here. Uh, uh, this does not mean that you have to kind of focus on this specifically, whether it's heavy or light, uh, but it just means that you are aware of the breath. You know the breathing is happening, yeah. You know, and here because all you have to know is one aspect of the breath. It's kind of a simple awareness of the breath, not a very complex one. Uh, you don't have the full awareness yet, it's just the awareness of one particular aspect. Heavy or light, you don't need much focus to be able to be aware of that. It starts with heavy, the long breath, and then the light, short breath, because that is often how the breath meditation is experienced. Yeah? It is experienced as long breath, and as you calm down a bit, it becomes more light or shorter after a while, once you start to settle down more. I think that is the main reason why you have that particular sequence. And so you know the breath here, yeah? They know, it says up here. And uh, it doesn't, further down it says practice, but here it says no. And the difference is that uh, at this point, because you're already mindful, you already know what is happening. You don't have to practice, you don't have to do anything. It's automatic that you know these things. Uh, this is not about making the breath long or short. Yeah? It is not your job to interfere with the breath. It is simply awareness of what the breath is like yeah, right there. Yeah. That is all it is. Yeah. And usually you are aware of the long breath first. Yeah. So it's just awareness of the breath. Yeah. You can even forget about the heavy and light. You're aware that the breath is there. Yeah. Every breath. Then you go to the light breath. Yeah. And then, uh, once you have come to the light breath, uh, then uh, you have to start what is called here the practice. And the practice here uh, means that it is not automatic that you get to this point. Uh, yeah, it will take some time. Usually when you start watching the breath, you will not be very peaceful yet. The mindfulness will not be super strong. Uh, but as you practice, as you stay with the breath, uh, the mindfulness tends to sharpen. Uh, Things become more peaceful. Uh, and this is what is meant by the practice here, uh, is the giving yourself time for things to calm down. Uh, it doesn't mean that you do this. Uh, it doesn't mean that you, uh, uh, it is much to be done. It's just the ability to wait and to stand back and to be the passive observer. And that ability to be the passive observer, that is the practice in this case. Uh, and then you start uh, recognizing what it says here, the whole body. Uh, and we'll get, come back to the meaning of the whole body in a second. In the meantime, let's do a little bit of meditation. We're talking about meditation, might as well do some meditation as well. Huh? <laughs>
Okay, so any um, questions, uh, please? Uh, Um, regarding the um, awareness of the breathing, yeah, and we want to know the process. Um, just let it run. But when noting it, do we label it like um, mm. this is long? But to come to the conclusion that it's actually long or short, deep or light, it is after yeah. the breathing. Uh, we are noting it. We are not. We are not willing it. Um, so we can only know that it's long or short at the end of that breathing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. how do we how, do we do we label it in the first place and then yeah. do we note it at the end? Okay. Thank you. So the uh, the idea of labeling it is kind of one particular technique that is done in one of the Burmese uh, systems of meditation practice. Uh, and I don't, this is not really what is meant I, by this sutta. It has been discussed by many people. Uh, it is 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 merely an awareness of what is going. Pajanati, you understand things. You don't have to, you don't have to label it or to verbalize it or anything like that in your mind. Uh, and it doesn't. It, and whether it's long or short also is not really the issue. You don't, it's not. It's not some judgment of the breath. You're trying to judge whether it's long or short or whatever. It's more simply the fact that you know each breath. Uh, so the reason why it says long and short, I think, is just that to be able to know long or short, you have to know every breath, right? So it is the idea is that you are aware of every single breath that's going on. Uh, but there's no real need to know. I th it, uh, the knowing is automatic anyway. Uh, yeah, It's not something that you have to do. Uh, it is automatic. If you are aware of what's going on and you have mindfulness, uh, then if someone asks you, then you, you will actually be able to tell whether the breath is short or long. Uh, Hopefully no one asks you in the middle of meditation, but uh, <laughs> so you will, it, it will happen anyway. So your job is just really to be aware of one breath after the other. Uh, and the fact that it's long and short is actually completely incidental, it's not really important. Uh, it's just a way of saying that every breath should be known. Uh, that's kind of that, that's what it means really. Uh, the noting technique is, uh, I, is often, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really recommend it uh, because it can become an obsession of the mind. Once you get used to it, you can't let go of the noting. Uh, and then you are stuck with all this verbalization, which actually becomes a hindrance uh, for some people in the practice. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really mean verbalizing. And this has been, I think, established quite well by scholars that it doesn't mean that. Uh, it just means that you have awareness of what is happening uh, without actually saying anything. Uh, yeah. Which one is more important, in or out? Uh, I think I, I think you have to do both, otherwise you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> if you only breathe out, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything? Yeah. Same person again, no, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Ajahn, um, do we then note it at a particular spot? Okay, that's another important point. Okay, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Uh, um, so the, uh, this idea that you have to locate it at a particular spot comes from the commentaries. Uh, and the commentaries say that you should uh, look, see the breath at the nas agga. Nas agga means the tip of the nose, quite literally. Uh, and so this is then becomes the standard interpretation from the commentaries. Uh, but uh, I follow Ajahn Brahma's uh, technique, which is not to look at the breath in, in the particular spot. Uh, and that is because it is breath meditation, not body, con body meditation. So you are just aware of the breath. If you close your eyes, uh, you don't really have to look at it anywhere. You can just close your eyes and you, you, you know the breath, even though you don't have a particular place where you know it. Uh, yeah? it's just, it's just, you just have awareness of the breath. Uh. So the general awareness of the breath is more relaxed. If you try to kind of pin it down on the tip of the nose too early, 
Maybe when your mindfulness becomes very strong, you can do that. Uh, but initially, just have a general awareness of the breath, uh, wherever it is. Uh, just know where it's long uh, or know where it's short. Uh, it's the, f don't, don't worry about where you know that. Just know the fact that it's long or short. Uh, yeah? That's kind of that's what I would recommend. And this is, the, again, the, the whole idea here is the idea of parimukkang. Parimukkang is uh, this word which is, uh, uh, again, has been studied a lot by various people who are into these kind of studies. Uh, you see, the word is just, we just saw it before up here, parimukkang, satting upotapetva, having established mindfulness parimukkang. Uh, and the meaning seems to be something like in front rather than specifically the tip of the nose or, or something like that. Uh. In front of the nose, if in front, just in front, in a sense of in general, in the presence, in the here and now, yeah, in front of you. I mean, the breath is like in front of you, right? Because it's kind of a, a f awareness. I mean, it could be on the nose. Uh, it can be on the, it can be anywhere really. But I would not focus narrowly down in that way. Yeah. Yes, Jan. Uh, when we breathe in and we breathe out, right? Yeah. Do we follow the breath? Do you follow the breath? You initially you just know know the breath. Each breath you know it. Uh, you don't you know it is enough just to be aware. I, initially your mindfulness is not going to be that sharp, uh, so it takes a while before you can follow it properly. So initially just aware one breath, next breath, uh, yeah, one is long, one is short, or whatever. And I think this is why they use the idea of long and short because it means that you have to be aware of every breath to be able to know whether it's long or short, uh, even though whether it's long or short actually is, is quite irrelevant. Uh, so uh, just knowing each breath, uh, you catch each breath. And then as your mindfulness improves, then you start knowing the whole breath. Uh, and the whole breath means following it all the way, right? Or the whole thing. Or focusing in one spot and knowing the whole in and out through that spot. Uh, that's another way of following it, if you like. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Sir. Yeah, but uh, I've got two questions. One yeah. is regarding, regarding the word parimukhan. Hmm. Uh, <coughs> Mante Ponaji interpreted as pari mukang according to the Murray word mukang from the word mukang which means the face so mm. say around the face mm. the face in the face we have yeah. five five senses yeah so he interpreted as pari mukang means focusing on the five senses <laughs> <laughs> okay so, um, so I'm yeah. not sure whether this is a way to interpret yeah. it or I well, I, I think the well, the mukang has two meanings. Mukang means face, or it can also mean mouth. You see, yeah. so it, it, it that depends a little bit on the context which one it means. And pari is a prefix which usually means around. And that's usually true, but not always. So this this is a bit tricky to determine exactly what it means. Uh, but but generally speaking, yes, around the face is true. Huh? Yeah, basically that's true. Huh? But the five senses, I would say. Not really, because it actually specifically says you are aware of the breath, right? That's what it says in this one here. You're aware of the long breath and the short breath. Uh, and you don't need all the five senses to be aware of the breath. I mean, it's not going to be much sound. Uh, you're not going to see anything, uh, right? You're not going to taste very much. Uh, the main thing is the physical contact of the, of the body. That's how you basically know the breath. Uh, you cannot really know the breath through the five senses, because this is about anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is the knowledge of the breath that is important. How do you know the breath? through the sense of touch. But uh, around the face, I generally agree with that. That's like in front of you, right? Face in front of you right here. Yeah. Same kind of meaning, yeah. Okay. The second question is regarding the yeah. sutta that you touched on yes yesterday, MN128, the corruption. Yeah. Uh, see, I develop immersions while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Yeah. And without placing the mind, just keeping it connected. So you're referring to uh, vitaka vichara. Yeah. Is it placing the focus on the light or placing the focus on the breath? Uh, you are beyond the breath at this point. Yeah, you're even beyond the light. You have, uh, when you enter the jhana, it's like the light itself become, kind of uh, disappears and you kind of enter enter the light or you fall into the jhana. And it's, a, it's just a state of bliss, really. Yeah. And uh, so what the focus is there is just the bliss. You're focusing on the bliss and you're attracted to the bliss. And that's what uh, we talk about the wobble of the mind. The mind is kind of drawn to the bliss and then it releases a little bit. There's a slight wobble. So you can see the bliss itself is wobbling a little bit. Uh, yeah? 
becoming stronger, a bit weaker. Yeah. And that wobble is what we call vitaka vichara in the first jhana. Yeah. It's a very slight movement of the mind. Uh, second jhana, the vitaka vichara is completely gone. This is the very last bit of vitaka vichara in samsaric existence. Uh, yeah, the very last bit. And you can imagine it would be very refined. Uh, it would not be thought in the ordinary sense of the word. It would be more like a, the final movement of the mind, if you like. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, carry on a little bit, and we'll come back to some more questions uh, soon. Uh. So now we come to this uh, interesting uh, part here. Uh, they practice like this, I will breathe in experiencing the whole body. They practice like this, I will breathe in ex out experiencing the whole body. This is the third stage of Anapanasati. Uh. And um, the question here is, what does whole body mean? Uh? Because uh, the Pali word is over here is sabbakaya. Patisang uh, Vede is experience, Sabakaya is the whole body. Yeah. Uh, so what exactly does it mean? And uh, I say the obvious meaning of whole body here is the whole breath. Uh, and the reason why that is the obvious meaning is because at the end of the sutta it says that the breath is called a body among bodies. Uh, and that's why you're doing body contemplation while you're watching the breath. Yeah? It specifically says the breath is a kind of body. And uh, because this is the context, the context here is mindfulness of breathing, uh, it makes very good sense that what we should understand this as is an experience in the whole breath. Uh, and this is where we are, you were mentioning before, uh, uh, the question from over there, the idea of seeing the breath in the whole length. Yeah, This is kind of where that comes in, the idea of your mindfulness is increasing. Uh, your ability to be aware is actually larger, greater now than it was before. Uh, so you have the ability to stay with the entire length of the breath not just a particular point or a particular aspect of that breath. Uh, it is common in the Goenka tradition to uh, understand this to mean the whole physical body. Uh, and that means that you go from the breath awareness to the whole physical body awareness. Uh, and uh, is, does, does it make a difference? Uh, it Maybe not. Uh, it depends on what you do afterwards. If you come back to the breath again, if you're able to focus back on the breath to go to the nimitta and all of these kind of things, uh, if that is what happens, if you, the process carries on, then it may not be matter all that much. Uh, but uh, because uh, this is about breath meditation, and because this is the whole purpose of this whole thing, uh, I would argue that the best thing is just to carry on with the breath. That is the most likely to give good results. Uh, and that is, to my mind, very obvious what is actually happening here when we talk about the whole body. The important point here is that this word kaya, yeah, this word kaya that we see over here, uh, which is often translated as body, yeah, it doesn't really mean body in the ordinary sense. Uh, it means more like the sentient body. Yeah. Yeah, it means more like a, it can also mean like a conglomeration of phenomena, like a group of various phenomena. So you can have a body in a, like a body of evidence in English, for example. Yeah, a corporate body is just a group coming together. And kaya is used like that. It's used to mean a heap of phenomena grouped together as because they relate to each other. Huh? And uh, this is uh, uh, probably part of the meaning here. Huh? And uh, so this is probably why it is used in this way. Huh? Uh, the, um, elsewhere, they talk about the Kaya Sankara. Kaya Sankara means they like the bodily volition and is actually defined again as the breath in the suttas. Huh? So there's a lot around breath around this. Huh? So if I were anyone uh, practicing this, I would just consider all of these things as breath, even though it is often translated as the whole body, uh, which uh, to me is a little bit misleading because uh, it's easy to misunderstand what is going on. So your attention is expanding. This is what happens as you practice this. Uh, attention becomes more sharp, it is expanding, uh, and you have the ability uh, for greater awareness. And this is actually what is happening here. It's already becoming quite nice. If you're able to go with this, uh, and you are at ease with it, you are relaxed with it, uh, you're not trying to do this, uh, it already now is kind of starting to become quite pleasant, actually. Uh, you see the whole breath in this way. Uh. And then the next stage, even more pleasant. Uh. They practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in, stilling the physical process. Uh. This is the kaya sankara, as you see here, see over here. Uh. Uh, I practice like I will breathe out, stilling the physical process. So, kaya sankara. Sankara is the 
word, which means the volition or the will. Uh, uh, and it also means like, um, uh, the, 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 like the will of the body, but also the process or the forces in the body. Yeah. So here, like the movement or the activity of the body, because activity comes from the idea of will. Uh. So what you are calming down here is the activity of the body, if you like, the physical process. Uh. And uh, that activity of the body is really here, is the breath. The breath is the main thing that is the activity of the body. So what you're tranquilizing is the breath itself. Elsewhere, the Kaya Sankara is said to end completely in the fourth jhana. There's no more breathing uh, in the fourth jhana. And uh, there, the meaning is very obvious, what it, what it refers to. Uh, uh, so this is obviously the meaning here as well. So pasambayang is the interesting word here, which means to calm down, uh, yeah, or stilling. Uh, and so the physical process, the breath, is starting to calm down. Uh, yeah, and this is where we start to see the kind of the hallmarks uh, of meditation practice. Uh, one of the hallmarks of meditation is this continuous stilling and calming down of everything. Uh, how do you know that your meditation is working? Well, because things are becoming more still, more peaceful, more calm, more tranquilized. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks. The other hallmark of meditation is a sense of happiness and gladness that you are experiencing. Yeah? If you are experiencing more and more gladness or less suffering, more happiness uh, in this process, and you're also experiencing more calm, uh, these two things coming together, you know you're on the right track. These are the two hallmarks of meditation working rightly. And here you see the first hallmark already now, and we will see this again and again as we go through this particular sutta. Deeper and deeper aspects of stilling and calming deeper and deeper aspects of joy and bliss as we go through this. Uh, so now already becoming quite nice. You're becoming very peaceful here already uh, at this particular point. Uh, we're starting to really enjoy the meditation. No very little thought going on because you're aware of the whole breath. Uh, things calming down uh, and you are becoming a quite a happy meditator already now. It's just the beginning. It's just stage four of 16 and already you're experiencing quite a lot of happiness uh, as a result of the meditation. Uh, Pasangbayang kaya sankaran pasisamiti sikakaraniya sikkati rather. So this is the first four stages of uh, mindfulness of breathing, uh, and these four stages are equivalent to the kaya nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. If you read the Satipatthana Sutta, they divide into four sections: kaya nupassana, first part; second part, vedana nupassana; third part, citta nupassana; fourth part, dhamma nupassana. Yeah four parts of Satipatthana. Kaya Nupassana means contemplation of body, Vedana Nupassana means contemplation of feeling, Chitta Nupassana means contemplation of mind, Dhamma Nupassana means contemplation of phenomena, principles, something like that. Uh, it's a little bit unclear exactly what it refers to there. And each of those four Satipatthanas uh, is equal to four of the 16 steps here. So we have four times four, 16. Four of these is one Satipatthana. Four times. So now we go from the Kaya Nupasana to the Vedana Nupasana, contemplation of feeling. The next four steps are equivalent to contemplation of feeling here. Yeah. Have I lost anyone by saying this? Uh, yes, okay, I thought I, thought I might have. That's, yeah. uh, <laughs> don't worry too much about it. I'm just. What I'm doing is I'm saying that uh, Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, and Satipatthana are equivalent practices. Uh, when we talk about Satipatthana practice, uh, the main highway to doing Satipatthana, Satipatthana is mindfulness meditation, yeah? Satipatthana Sutta, the main highway to doing Satipatthana meditation is mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? Yeah? And uh, there's four Satipatthanas, uh, and each one of those uh, are talked about in the Anapanasati Sutta as well. Anap Anapanasati Sutta has 16 stages, uh, so they're grouped into four times four. Uh, each Satipatthana is equivalent to four uh, aspects of the Anapanasati Sutta. Don't worry too much about it. It's a bit hard to show without having a table. If, next time I'll bring a table for you and I'll show how it w works out. Uh, uh, so now we come to the Vedana Nupasana, contemplation of feeling. And this is what it has to say here. They practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in experiencing rapture. Uh, yeah, this is the famous word piti in Pali. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing rapture. Uh, 
the practice like this. I'll breathe in experiencing bliss. Sounds good, doesn't it? Breathing in experiencing bliss. The practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing bliss. The practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing mental process processes. The practice like this. I'll breathe out experiencing mental processes. The practice like this. I will breathe in stilling the mental processes. The practice like this. I will breathe out stilling the mental processes. Right, so straight away you can see the word stilling again, right? I'm saying this is a kind of uh, thing you see all the way through here. Pasambayang over there, the same word used again. Uh. So this is something you see again and again. And here, of course, the idea of happiness and bliss is becoming prevalent. Yeah, This is the other uh, hallmark of the meditation process, the bliss and the joy of the experience uh, and the calming of the experience. Uh. And you will notice again, they practice like this, right? So this is not automatic. You have to keep on practicing as you practice in the right way, which means being the passenger on the train, not doing the meditation, not trying to be blissful, but allowing the bliss to happen by itself when it is ready. Then it comes. A lot of the time, all you have to do is to allow the process to work, the mind, the, the breath calms down, and at a certain point, when the breath becomes very calm and very delightful, uh, because the breath is delightful, uh, the rapture starts to rise as a consequence. Uh, and you get this powerful energy in the body and the mind, which is the hallmark of the rapture, the piti in the Pali. Uh, very important part of the meditation process. Uh, yeah, and you can feel the f kind of physical sensation very often, right? Or physical and mental together. Yeah. It's very delightful when you come to this stage. Yeah. And you really, it's, you know, with each stage, the uh, meditation becomes more interesting and more delightful. But already here, it is already very delightful and enjoyable what you're doing here. Yeah. You breathe in experiences, you breathe out experiencing this, right? Uh, then the meditation develops further, and when it develops further, you start breathing in experiencing bliss. This is sukkha. And sukkha is a more peaceful experience than a rapture. Uh, rapture has more movement in it. Uh, it has more energy in it. Uh, uh, bliss is a more peaceful, and because it is more peaceful, it is even more profound, uh, even more delightful than the, than the rapture beforehand. Uh, so you're moving forward yeah, to more and more profound experiences. Uh, feeling, it feels more and more meaningful what you're doing. Yeah. Calm and bliss, both gradually coming up, both becoming more powerful as you do this. Uh. Then uh, the next one is you breathe in experiencing the mental processes. Yeah? What are mental processes? Uh? You can see over here the Pali word is citta sankara. These are the mental processes. Patisang Veda is uh, calming it down. Oh, sorry, experiencing it. Uh, so what is this? Well, these mental processes are what is happening in your mind. It is largely perception, uh, yeah, and it is uh, feeling. Yeah. These are usually called citta sankara and the suttas. So you're calming down, or you're experiencing the perceptions and feelings at this particular point. Uh, yeah, this is the most likely meaning of this term right here. So in other words, it's more of what we have just seen. We have just seen piti, rapture, and bliss, sukha. Chitta sankara is more of that. Yeah, this, the mental processes you're experiencing more of those things. Uh, that's really what this means. It doesn't really add all that much. Uh, then the next one, and this is why that stage is there, because the next one is calming down those processes, calming down those feelings. Uh, calming down those perceptions. So whatever mental content is left in your mind, uh, now you, you allow it to calm down. Uh, yeah, it becomes even more peaceful. Uh, and again, this is, happens by merely being passive, uh, being the passenger on the train, uh, allowing the process to calm down. There's nothing that you do at this point, uh, allowing things to calm down even further. So bliss, happiness, and calming, bliss and calming, again and again, the hallmarks of this whole process. Uh, so this is equivalent to Vedana Nupasana, contemplation of feeling. You can now see why that is the case, uh, because this here is all about Vedana, about feeling things. Uh. Now there's a couple of things about this that is extremely interesting here. Yeah. <laughs> I say that to get your attention. Did it work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But what, why is this so interesting? Well, the reason why this is interesting, and for those of you who know the Satipatthana Sutta, you will know that in the Satipatthana Sutta, it talks under Vedana and Vipassana, it talks about the various kind of feelings you're supposed to contemplate. Uh, and it talks about Dukkha Vedana, painful feelings. Uh, it talks about uh, Samisa Dukkha Vedana, worldly painful feelings. It, talk about, it talks about Niramisa Dukkha Vedana, um, unworldly or spiritual painful feelings. Uh, then it talks about neutral feelings, then it talks about happy feelings. And from that Satipatthana Sutta, many people assume that you have to contemplate painful feelings uh, as part of the contemplation process, because it is in the Satipatthana Sutta. But here, no painful feelings are mentioned. How can that be? Now this sutta specifically says that this way of contemplating fulfills uh, the feeling contemplation. In other words, you don't have to do anything apart from this. This is a complete contemplation in its own right. Uh. So how come the unpleasant and the neutral feelings are missing? Uh? What's going on here? Uh? And what is going on? And this is kind of the good news. Uh, what is going on? You don't have to contemplate those painful feelings directly. Uh. You don't have to actually stay with the painful feelings and contemplate them like that. Uh. The way to contemplate the painful feelings, and this is kind of the implication of this, uh, is that you contemplate them through their absence. Uh. Yeah, they are no longer there. So when you come out of your meditation afterwards uh, and you reflect back on what was happening, you saw the painful feelings were absent. That is the most powerful way of contemplating anything uh, is through its absence. Uh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, I, because if you think about how we contemplate uh, anything in this world, yeah, if you, for example, uh, take uh, the kind of the classic example is the tadpole becoming a frog. Yeah? If you are a tadpole uh, and you are immersed in water, uh, it's impossible for you to know what water is uh, because you have no comparison. You're always in the water. Uh. But then when the tadpole becomes a frog, it jumps out of the water for the first time, then it can understand water because it has a comparison. Uh. And it's exactly the same thing here with insight. Insight is the most powerful when things cease. Because when they cease, you are out of that thing, and then you can understand it fully for the first time. So here, because you are only experiencing happy feelings, you are completely withdrawing from painful feelings. That is the most powerful way to understand what painful feelings are. So this whole idea of sitting and contemplating pain it's not necessary. It's a pain to contemplate pain, so don't do it. <laughs> so it is not really required, right? And I think this is such a very interesting idea that comes out of this whole thing of understanding the process of meditation properly. You don't have to sit with pain. You're not, I have heard of many people sitting with pain, and they haven't really learned much from it anyway. They just sit with pain, 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 okay, arising, and you see it changing a little bit, but I don't see any profound insight into it. The really profound insight come when the pain ceases, uh, because then you get a full perspective for what is going on. Uh. Isn't that good news? Uh? I think that's really, really good news. It's kind of, you, we can forget about the pain. Uh. And uh, so, um, yeah, and this is how Ajahn Brahm has always taught meditation. And I, I always thought, wow, this is a really cool way of teaching meditation. So I, I just, that's why I took Ajahn Brahm to, as my teacher, because he sounded like the. Um, it was the right, a nice way of practicing here. Yeah. So, so this is the first thing here to notice. The second thing which I think is interesting here, and this is the question, well, how do you go from here, we have a set stilling the physical processes, how do you go from that stilling of physical processes uh, to experiencing rapture? Uh, yeah, it is quite common for people to have problems in making that kind of progress uh, because uh, uh, you know, you can feel very peace. Many people feel peaceful in the meditation, but they don't get any joy arising in the meditation. So how do we encourage that process from happening? This is a very important point of, of a meditation experience. Uh, and this is where this idea of nudging the mind comes in. Uh, yeah, remember I was talking the other day about all the various ways of enjoying the meditation, uh, yeah, having an appreciation for your kalyanamitas, uh, having an appreciation for how you have lived your life through sila, for, through acts of generosity that you have done, maybe contemplating the Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, or whatever. All of these ways of contemplating are appropriate ways to give rise to joy. 
having a sense of gratitude, perhaps, uh, all of these things. Uh, so this is where that gentle nudg nudging of the mind can happen. Just a very, it's not a lot of thinking. Uh, it's more like bringing up a perception that is already there because you have trained yourself in the past uh, from bringing up, uh, from developing certain perceptions. Uh, now you bring that perception up. Uh, and as soon as you bring it up, you start to feel a certain happiness. If it works, you feel a certain happiness coming with that. And this is how the rapture can be given. Can give, you can give rise to rapture at this particular point if it doesn't happen automatic, automatically. You, often it will happen automatically. Often it will not happen regardless of what you do. Yeah, because you're not ready for it. So it's not going to happen anyway. But uh, this is uh, how to nudge it a little bit uh, and to help the process from happening here. Anapanasati. Isn't this interesting? Yeah, yeah this is kind of, I, I find this so interesting, this process. It is just really fascinating. It is attractive. It is uh, knowing the little kind of ins and outs of how this, how this process works uh, is very exciting. Yeah. So that is the um, first eight factors. We have been through half of the Anapanasati. The second half remains. Uh, so uh, that is equivalent to the Vedana Nupassana of the Satipatthana Sutta. And now we come to the Chitta Nupassana of the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, the third Satipatthana, uh, which is equivalent to the next four stages of Anapanasati. Yeah. So let's see how this is uh, explained here. Yeah. They practice like this. Uh, I'll breathe in experiencing the mind. They practice like this. I will breathe out experiencing the mind. The practice like this, I'll breathe in gladdening the mind. The practice like this, I will breathe out gladdening the mind. The practice like this, I'll breathe in immersing the mind in samadhi or stilling the mind. The practice like this, I will breathe out stilling the mind. The practice like this, I'll breathe in freeing the mind. The practice like this, I'll breathe out freeing the mind. So again, you can see here the idea of stilling. Here you have immersing the mind in samadhi, which is stilling the mind. You have the idea of tranquilizing. And then here you have the idea of gladdening, just up here. Yeah? Gladdening and tranquilizing. So again, this process continues. More stilling, more stilling, more gladdening, more joy. Yeah? Stage after stage. But the first one here is experiencing the mind that we have up here. So what does that mean, to experience the mind? Now again, this is again similar to the idea of the tadpole in water. How do you know what something is? Well, it is by taking away the things that it is not. So what is the mind not? Well, what the mind is not is the body and the five senses. That is what the mind is not. And when you start to... So when the body and the five senses start to fade, what comes into focus is the mind. And usually the way that that mind appears is like a light. Yeah? This light we have been talking about, uh, we saw that it, in the Upakilesa Sutta, this is where this light begins. Uh, and this is exactly that same spot as we had in the Upakilesa Sutta yesterday. Yeah? Yeah, you see a light and you see forms. Uh, and that light, uh, that is here the most likely and the most obvious interpretation, understanding what citta means in this context. You are experiencing the mind. Uh, you have taken away those things that are not mind, uh, body and five senses. Uh, not fully taken away, they're still there in the background, uh, but they are becoming very weak. So the mind is then appearing here. Yeah. And again, uh, there's nothing you have to do. This is like an automatic process. Uh, it happens as this process, just by you being passive. The more passive you are, the further you go in this process, the more passive you have to be, uh, because any kind of movement will disturb what is happening here. Yeah. And then you continue your practice. Yeah? Now you will breathe in, gladdening the mind. How do you gladden the mind? Well, you just stay with that nimitta. You stay with that uh, uh, image that you have in your mind. Yeah? That sun or the moon or that uh, bright light that you have. You just stay with it. You focus on it. And as you focus on it, uh, on the bright part, uh, the mind gladdens. Uh, again, you are passive. The joy becomes even stronger than it was before. Uh, And then uh, you don't just make it glad, but you also still it even more. Uh, yeah? You actually bring it uh, to samadhi, uh, uh, samadhan, which means stilling the mind. Uh, 
moving more and more towards samadhi, more and more stillness of the mind there. Again, all you do, stay with the object. You focus on the center of the object, stay with it as you do that. Uh, this process happens by itself. And because it is such a joyful process, uh, it is fairly easy to stay with the object as a consequence. Uh. And then, the very last step here uh, is the idea of freeing the mind. Uh. What does that mean? It just means that you allow the mind. The very last thing you do is that you let go, basically. And the letting go in that very last moment is the, is the freeing of the mind. What are you letting go of? Uh, this is the final letting go of the five senses and the body. Yeah? At this point, they disappear. Once you free the mind, they are gone. This is like entering a jhana state. Uh, the jhanas are often called uh, vimuttis or vimokas uh, in the suttas. Uh, and here you see the word vimochayang. Vimochayang is li uh, related to the idea of vimutti and vimoka. It means to liberate or to free something. Yeah. So here you're going into this process, you're entering a jhana state. This is to me the natural interpretation of the sutta, and in large part I'm just following the, uh, the way Ajahn Brahm looks at this. Yeah. And uh, so you are liberating the mind from the body and the five senses. Uh, you're also liberating the mind from the five hindrances. At this point, they are completely gone. Up to this point, there has been a tiny, tiny amount left of the five hindrances. And those hindrances are the things we looked at in the Upakilesa Sutta. Slight restlessness, slight dullness. The mind is not super bright. And that lack of super brightness is a tiny bit of dullness in the mind. And the last thing that you are liberating the mind from here is the will. The doing stops, the deliberate doing stops at this point. Uh, you have calmed the mind down completely, and now the mind is on automatic at this particular point. Uh, so this is how the entry to the jhanas happened through this particular process. Uh, so just coming back again to the idea of uh, uh, here we have experiencing the mind, citta pati sangvedi. Uh, so how do we go from the previous one, citta sankharang pasisami? Uh, this is kind of calming, stilling the mental processes, right? How do we go from the stilling the mental processes uh, to experiencing the mind? Uh, how do we make this leap? Now, so what is the, the significant thing here, what uh, takes you from one to the other, is that as not, when you're stilling the mental processes, uh, there is still the body and the five senses are still there to some extent, right? Uh, and that is what we are leaving behind. That's why we are experiencing the mind in the next state. Yeah. So sometimes all you have to do at that process, again, if it doesn't happen automatically, often it will happen automatically, the light will just come up and you go there. If it doesn't happen automatically, what you have to do is you have to do a very brief, again, it's about nudging the mind, not really contemplating, yeah, but a brief reminder of the suffering of the sensory world. Yeah. We had a lot of look at this at the beginning, uh, yeah, how the five sense world is not really satisfactory. Uh, and this is where it really becomes incredibly helpful. Uh, because if you remember this at this particular point, uh, you will be able to let go of that and you will be able to move in to the experience of the mind instead. Uh. And then the mental world starts to come into focus. Uh, you start to see these beautiful lights in the mind uh, and you are now you are really, really enjoying this meditation in a very, very powerful way as a consequence. So now we have taken you all the way to the jhana states. And because we have gone all the way to the jhanas, let's do a bit of meditation.
So any uh, comments or questions on this, please? Uh, please fire away. Over there we have one. Uh, Good afternoon, Ajahn. Good afternoon. Um, I have questions about Verdana. Um, when you mentioned that in, in this sutta there was no uh, contemplation on pain. Yeah. Um, now, painful thoughts and painful feelings can naturally arise when we do meditation. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering how. Yeah. How does this sutta okay. kind of talk about? Yeah. How do we do yeah, when sure. you have this pain? Okay. No, thank you. That's a good. That's a good important question, actually. And uh, uh, so, the, with pain, I would say, in the beginning, you can try to ignore it because sometimes it's just a short little pain and it comes and it goes again and it's not a big issue. Huh? But if you find that the pain becomes obsessive, that the mind goes to it all the time, it becomes a burden and a problem, huh? then I would always recommend to change your posture huh? if you can. Huh? Take a new posture, sit in another way. Uh, even, if, even if you have to lie down, huh? even that is okay if, if pain is a problem. Especially for people who have chronic pain, for example, uh, and then they need to find some way that can be reasonably comfortable. Uh, that's how I would deal with it. Don't, you know, some pain is always the nature of the body. We cannot move every time there's a little bit of pain, but when it becomes a problem, an obsession of the mind, going to it again and again, then move the posture. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, you, uh, but I, I, so that is uh, one side of things. But what I'm really find uh, troublesome is when uh, people kind of almost deliberately cultivate pain. Uh, uh, when you're told, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really painful, I'll keep on sitting and, and contemplate it. And usually I found that to be incredibly counterproductive. First of all, you don't get much insight into it. Uh, secondly, you give up on meditation completely very soon if you do too much of that kind of thing. I've seen too many people giving up on meditation precisely because the demands are so high and so and also not very productive of anything positive. Uh, and so the whole purpose of meditation practice and the uh, spiritual path is to enhance the quality of life, to make our life better. There's enough problems already. We don't have to make the spiritual path problematic. <laughs> you know, and this is kind of my thing. Then there's the, the mind, the problems in the mind. And I was actually going to say that just now, that uh, this Chitta Nupasana, which is the four steps we have seen here, uh, they also have the same kind of thing. They, say that you would contemplate the negative mindsets and the positive mindsets, yeah? the, uh, the ill will and the lack of ill will, the greed, the lack of greed, the delusion, the lack of delusion. So it's a similar kind of thing as for the feelings in the body. The mental bad states are also mentioned, but when you look at this one here, it's all the good mental states. No mention at all about the bad ones. Uh. So again, the way to contemplate the bad ones uh, is through the absence rather than through the presence. Uh. I don't think you're going to learn all that much by contemplating ill will while it's there, because when you have ill will, you are deluded. You can't really learn very much when it is present. It's its absence, that's when you learn about it. So, but the painful feelings in the mind, how to deal with it? Uh, it depends on what kind of pain it is. Yeah? I, it, you have, maybe have to be a bit more specific. If it's sadness, for example, grief, that sort of thing, uh, uh, then you have to try to change your perspective probably uh, somehow uh, yeah, to deal with that and somehow overcome it. Uh, or it may be that you are using meditation as a way of alleviating the sadness. If it does help to alleviate, then it's okay to stay with the sadness because it's at least helpful to some extent. Uh, but uh, usually these kind of painful feelings uh, are, are dealt with outside, learning how to think about the situation in a new way, so as to overcome the grief and the sadness. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Ajahn, thank, thank you. I think it's clearer. But so can I connect it to what you have mentioned much earlier, that <clears throat> um, to start meditation, we need to have a reasonably balanced mind. Yeah. So example, if someone has just recently went through some, some trauma, negative trauma, uh, it's probably not suitable to start meditating because the mind is, is not balanced. 
It, it depends. I would say it depends on the, if the meditation makes the imbalance worse, so they feel the grief more, uh, then maybe it's the wrong time. But if the meditation helps to soothe the grief, uh, for whatever reason, then you can still do it. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the introduction of the Anapanyasati Sutta, yep. the Buddha says this Anapanyasati this Anapanasati meditation is peaceful. I think maybe we can check it up somewhere. It's, if I'm not wrong, it must be there. I, I think it's in the very introduction. Yeah. And I believe because yeah. he's saying that this Anapanasati meditation is peaceful and leads to the development of, of uh, the four foundations of mindfulness, this word peaceful, uh, it's that's the reason why there are no uh, uh, dukkha feelings here, whether physical nor mental, uh, ex, uh, uh, mentioned here. Because if ideally it really the process goes like this, then hmm. yeah, we maybe we have to. Uh, it, it says it is very fruitful and beneficial, yeah. but. Yeah. That is not. Is this the? That is not the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta. It, it is. It is not. But it it's, is it, not. It's, it's more. Thing, Let, let's it, check if the, this yeah, word yeah. peaceful or something no, like it, this can it, be found. I think it occurs in the, in the, the in different, the introduction. different versions of the Anapanasati Sutta, and, and the, that could be an indication the, the, uh, for the, no negative, for yeah. no painful feelings. The, the, there is a version in the. Um, in the uh, Vinaya Pitaka, that which has that particular phrasing that you're talking about. But, uh, but I think in the just in the one one eight, it's also there. If I'm not uh, mistaken, I I don't think so. This is the because this is the beginning right here. Uh, yeah, this is the beginning. It says yeah. the training. Uh, the uh, yeah, uh, uh, the the various monk monk groups are training in this way. That's true. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So here we are. The Sangha Manika committed to developing meditation on love. Uh, Meditation on Eightfold Path, Awakening Factors, right? Um, there is mendicants in the Sangha, in the Sangha, the mendicants who have come to develop love, compassion, equanimity, the ugliness, permanence. It will develop the four foundations develop. of mindfulness, the, se the seven so enlightenment factors. Here you are, this is the one you're talking about, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm mistaken, they're very fruitful and beneficial for what I think it was peaceful. If you go, that's, that's if this is the Vinaya Pitaka, um, uh, what happened here? Well, let's see. Gee, it's not coming up. What's going on? Hmm. How come it's not coming up? <laughs> Maybe refresh. Okay. Don't know what's happening here. Something weird is happening. But I, I know what you mean, uh, Ronnie, because I, I know I've seen that myself. But I think it is a different version of the Anapanasati Sutta, which has that beginning. So I, I know what you're talking about. So I, I, I trust you. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to prove it to me. I, I know what you're talking about. So, yeah. 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 Between yeah. uh, this uh, peaceful or whatever the, the word is uh, mm. and uh, 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 and uh, only only happy feelings, right? Yeah, that could be a that could be a link. Uh, that could be a link. Yeah, but it, that's true. Uh, but so, so I agree with you. And it, it it also says, and that is what is interesting to me, is that it says that this way of doing it fulfills the Satipatthana. Uh, yeah, you remember that one at the end of the sutta? It says that. Uh, so each one of these uh, categories actually completes the Satipatthana practice. This is all you have to do to actually do the Satipatthana. Which is uh, fascinating. That's from and from that is where I take the idea that uh, you don't actually have to do the uh, the uh, pain contemplation at all, except in the absence of the pain. Uh, so, uh, yeah. All right. Anyone else like to say anything? Actually, it's already two thirty. Maybe we can take some more questions later on, and we can uh, have a short break, fifteen minute break, yeah. and uh, just to just to have a break. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs>